Hey guys, Rich from Rich Me Gaming. Hope everyone is doing fantastically well. This is the first in our how to play video. So we're starting off with the OGs themselves. So we'll be doing an Avengers video after this, but today we're looking at Red Skull's Cabal. Now to make sure that it's just not my biased opinion on things, we've got Quinn with us once again. Quinn, how are you doing? I'm all right. Uh, and just to appease all of my, you know, lovely fans out there. Hello there. <laughs> Excellent. I might have to do a little animation of you just just popping up as uh, as you say. <laughs> so, guys, in this how to play video, we're going to be covering a number of different things. So, we're going to be looking at the leadership ability itself. So, as I mentioned with this one, it's going to be Red Skull's Cabal. We'll then be looking at the core of our squad. So, when we've got our roster together, there's going to be usually three or four characters that make it into the lineup every single game and then we add extra characters in there depending on what threat level we're at. So we'll be looking at the core characters, we'll then be looking at which affiliated characters we want to take and then lastly we'll be looking at which non-affiliated characters we want to take into the list as well and we'll give some reasonings behind each of those character choices and what they bring to the team. We'll then take a look at the tactics cards, once again starting with the affiliated tactics cards. We'll then also take a look at any character based tactics cards that we can take as well and then we'll look at whatever else is left over including the restricted ones and then rounding it off we'll be looking at which crisis cards we want to take but also which crisis cards we want to avoid as well and not necessarily the cards themselves but the setups and the and the layouts of each scenario so then red skulls cabal so let's starting out then let's take a quick look at red skull himself and the master of evil which is the cabal affiliation leadership that he brings and for me it's a really strong one but each time an allied character damages an enemy character with an attack after the attack is resolved the attacking character gains one power so that means that essentially using attacks that would normally not generate power if they do damage they're going to generate one power and also attacks such as beam attacks are going to generate multiple power for each individual attack as long as you do damage so quinn starting out with that leadership ability how, how do you think that ranks against some of the other leadership abilities we've got out there. Probably one of the best ways to address this is by splitting the leaderships in the game in two and effectively splitting them into the two two categories of sort of passive leaderships like this one and then active ones like say your bump in the night or your um mystic empowerment from defenders. Yeah. Um, and I think of of the passive ones, um it's probably in about the top three. Um yeah, it's a really solid leadership. Yeah, I, I agree. I do like it. I think it's um, on characters that will go through with people like Murdoch and other characters out there who, you know, they are a little power hungry, right? They've got lots of things they can spend that power on, um, getting extra power um, on top of some already really good builders, but using, you know, using your spenders and then still being able to generate power, especially if it's a beam attack, you know, somebody like yep. a Mr. Sinister or even a Vision where they're going to be generating so much power uh, from those from those beam attacks as well. Um, so yeah, so I really like the um, I really like the affiliation um, leadership ability. Core characters. Then I know we spoke about this uh, before we started recording, and surprisingly, we we, we came to an agreement pretty much straight <laughs> away. But mine and Quinn's recommendation is absolutely a core of Red Skull. Obviously, you have to take him using his leadership alongside Murdoch and Baron Zima. Um, and Quinn, why why did we agree on taking those other two characters alongside Red Skull? So I mean, they they both make absolutely brilliant use of that leadership. I mean, everyone does, uh, but characters like Zemo and Modok who have lots of superpowers that they can spend their power on. Zemo's got his Master Swordsman and his Counter-Strike to sort of fuel his damage, which then gets more and more power back on him. Uh, and Modok has his um, re-rolls that he pays for, which, I mean, effectively, you, you pay one for a re-roll. If it gets you a damage, you're gaining a power overall even yeah. more if you get a wild. Uh, but I mean, also with regard to the rest of Red Skull's kit, um, he's got his, it, it's Cosmic Cube and Master of the Cube. I can never remember which one's which, but you've got one that you roll five dice, get three power, take damage for failures. And then the other one is you place someone within two for three power. Yeah. Um, and that just synergizes really well with Modoc because 
he is a slower character, but he's sort of a he's he's sort of a mobile gun platform in that you sit <laughs> him in the middle of the board and he just murders anything within range four of him. Yeah, he really does, right? And and especially if there is a especially if there's another character within range two and you can pull that doomsday chair off. And I think because of that extra power that you're generating, because, you know, Murdoch only generates one power a turn, but because, you know, you can do one psionic blast and you're more than likely going to do damage with it, you can potentially roll a wild and sap power, you know, and then if you do damage, you get one extra power on top. Quite often you can pull off a doomsday chair turn one. You know, that just becomes devastating. And if you get the trigger and you do damage on both, it's only costing you one power for that doomsday chair if you're gaining a power back from each as well. So yeah, I, I really like Murdoch in... I mean, he makes a lot of unaffiliated lists, so it's not surprising that, you know, he's a, a core character in his sort of first affiliation, if you like. Yeah, definitely. And Baron Zemo then, I mean, we, we spoke about Baron Zemo on other videos previously, um, but really it's, it's just that support that he brings to the team isn't it those those rerolls yeah. are so valuable god i i love baron zemo so much he, i think he, even now he's still my favorite like th three threat in the game he just does such good things you know <laughs> i i like it when i have characters that can murder other characters which he does exceptionally well for a three threat uh and also just buffing your entire team offensively and defensively for absolutely zero cost like yeah not even really an inclusion cost for zemo because he does his own thing and he does it well enough to warrant three threat oh absolutely yeah that 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 range two bubble around him is is so so good and like you say he's got enough in his own mechanics and his own abilities that he's a good enough three threat without being able to offer rerolls to everyone as well so they are our three core characters, so adding up to 12 threat in total, but that's only three characters. We have 10 in our roster in total. So let's start then by taking a look at what other affiliated characters there are. We'll quickly run down the list and then uh, which of those characters we want to include and we'll give some reasons why. So rounding out the Cabal list then on top of these three characters, we've also got Sin, the alternative leader. We've got Bob, who is the only two threat option in the game that's affiliated we've got bullseye tanker cassandra nova crossbones enchantress killmonger kingpin loki magneto who i hate being in cabal <laughs> mr sinister uh mysterio mystique omega red Sabretooth, ultron and viper so a big list uh second largest affiliated list uh in the game at the moment quinn out of those characters um, who else are you taking in your Cabal roster and why? Yeah, I think, I mean, you mentioned this earlier with the leadership, but I think characters with beams uh, synergize exceptionally well with Red Skull. And I think yeah. sort of the, the two that stand out uh, are Enchantress and Mist Sinister for me. Yeah, I agree. Because Sinister brings a Mystic Beam that he pays one power for, but if you're doing damage and generating that power back, it's effectively free, which makes that a lot better because usually he only has enough power to do that like once every turn if people are ignoring him whereas if you're in cabal and you're doing damage with the red skull he's constantly gaining power from here he's actually it's actually functioning more like a builder because it's um you pay one for it but if you hit like multiple people and do damage to each you're gaining power overall and you're very likely to do a damage as well because it is a mystic attack yeah it's um, mystic it's also range four isn't it it is a range four yeah, b which, is... which... Oh, good. Yeah, so that beam four, but he's also then got uh, fun little playthings. So he's got that ability to actually move characters into his beam as well. And like you say, the fact that he does struggle a little bit for power generation, I have found that with with Sinister. Uh, and I definitely think he works really, really well in the Cabal leadership just because he's generating that power as well. So yeah, I like both of those shouts. Um, I also quite like Loki in there as well for for the beam attack and he's got that range four aura that you know it's not the it's not the greatest uh but it does add some additional restrictions to your to your opponent yeah it's also really nice when he flips because you get the extra blocking of crits on there and yeah your opponent just doesn't have a good time when loki's just stood on the board and isn't being murdered let's have a look at a couple of i would say sort of 
uh, unique niche players then with 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 characters. Um, Omega Red for one, obviously a newer character. I think maybe the latest addition, or at least one of the latest additions to the Cabal. Do you see much play with him? Have you used him much within the Cabal? Or um, I've not actually played a game uh, with Omega Red. Yeah, uh, I, I, when I say that, I mean, I haven't played with him myself. I've played against him uh, yeah. a handful of times. And he's effectively, like, he, he's sort of like Venom, but he he's a bit tankier in some ways, but doesn't have the same reactive play that Venom has. And, I mean, I think aff affiliated near Venom is good for pretty much anyone. And yeah, like, Omega Red, you know, he's got his healing, he's got his poison, which is actually quite an irritating condition. Um, yeah, like I think he's pr a pretty solid character. Um, I think again, yeah. he's another character that um, that does struggle for for power generation. You know, he only gains one power a turn, um, and again, he's only got that five uh, five damage. I say he's only got that five strength builder uh, with no sap or anything on there, or no pierce on there as well. For me, I quite like him in. Red Skull's uh, Cabal. Um, I like him on, you know, if you ever get into a, a either a C or a, or an E um, crisis, and we will talk about crisis afterwards, but, you know, where it's all down the middle or all to one side, because that death factor then becomes even more effective because there's just more characters around you who are going to suffer that damage. Yeah, I mean, I also think uh, the Ensnare actually synergizes relatively well with MODOK because... You don't really want to spend your actions with Modok walking somewhere to attack someone. So why not just pull the medium towards you instead with Omega Red? That sounds a lot better exactly. for you know, everyone's favourite chair boy. No, I, I agree. I agree. It can work uh, It can work very, very nice. So I've mentioned a couple of characters there that we like um, in affiliation. Who on this list are we never taking? I Who, mean, I, I already there? mentioned one of them. You did, uh, you did already I, mention I feel like Bullseye. I've bullied Bullseye enough today. I don't really <laughs> need to go back to him. Yeah, I, like, the thing is, there's no one that doesn't synergize with that leadership, apart from maybe Wong, because he doesn't make attacks. But anyone that makes attacks during a game, which is pretty much all of the characters in the game, is going to find some benefit from Skull's Cabal. Um, I think in terms of characters, you're not going to see very often simply because they're a bit subpar by comparison to others. Um, Ultron is someone that sticks out. Yeah, I think ever since drop-off became no longer a thing, Ultron has kind of lost his place in, in the Cabal. And I think he probably would have done anyway because of Mr. Sinister. I think if you want a flying character... Mr. Sinister is 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 going to be the option there. Yeah, I um, also constantly forget that he has flight because I've never there's nothing. Seen, yeah. I've never seen him fly in any sort of media he's ever been in. <laughs> yeah, the two two for me who I don't like that's Kingpin and Magneto. I mentioned not liking Magneto thematically. I hate the fact that you know he would ever be aligned with. Okay, I know they're not Hydra, but essentially Hydra. I I just think they're very they're too fairly expensive characters and you're losing out um on a big part of what they bring to the game which is their leadership abilities so for me i don't like magneto definitely don't like magneto in there uh because he generates you know the one thing that cabal bring is power generation and magneto doesn't struggle for power generation he you know he generates enough himself and yeah for me i just don't like kingpin i think you're losing a big part of his card by not having him as the leader. I, I do just want to give uh, one quick honourable mention to a character that I think does very well in Rogue Skull Cabal, which is Killmonger. Um, you don't see him on the table very often, but in a list that is sort of geared towards killing things, like Skull's Cabal is, uh, you know, getting two VPs for that if you kill the highest threat enemy model is actually really, really nice. And once he starts to rack up those kill count tokens, he becomes a real force to be reckoned with. Yes. And then also you've got the added benefit of him bringing some like sort of really heavy hitting energy attacks into the affiliation that aren't necessarily there otherwise because he's got you know five dice with a pierce with potential rerolls as well. It's actually really quite nice. Yeah, especially if he sat next to a Baron Zemo as well. Those extra rerolls from Zemo yeah. plus his own rerolls. Um and yeah, any any opportunity to be able to score VPs outside of the cleanup phase is always going to be a powerful thing so um so characters then 
outside of affiliation, who who are some uh, characters that we can bring into this cabal roster who either fill gaps that we didn't have uh, that, that that's missing in that in that um, cabal roster, even though it's a you know it's a large large affiliation list, um, or just synergize really well with the uh, the leadership ability. Who who would you look at from outside of affiliation and bring them in? Well, I think from my testing around the time where her card was revealed before she was actually physically out, um, I absolutely adore Domino in Skull Cabal because if she does her rapid fire attacks, she's generating power. Um, she has her probability manipulation to make it far more likely that she'll do damage on the attack, especially considering things tend to go her way and your opponent doesn't get crit. She can really sort of start to mince through people. And normally, you know, if you're doing a normal domino activation, say she's starting on one power because that's all she generates natively, you're, you're generally getting one uh, one extra crit per, like, attack, effectively, because you've only got that one power to spend. Yeah. Uh, whereas in Skull Cabal, after the first attack, that suddenly jumps up to potentially two extra crits that you're getting each attack, and then that really begins to snowball and you just melt characters. Like, I've had multiple occasions in Red Skull Cabal where I've moved a domino forward turn one and just, with, with a single action, I've killed Angela's quite comfortably. Yeah. No, absolutely, because, yeah, she she's a very, very solid three threat. Um, I'd argue one of, I don't think she's the best, but I'd argue one of the best no, three I, I think characters she is in the up game. There, but she's probably um, hovering around the top five, I'd yeah. imagine. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, one for me, and um, this is a guy who loves power. Um, he doesn't have a lot of things to spend it on, but he's got one thing that he can spend it on very, very nicely, and that's Iron Fist. Um, uh, I think you mean Danny Rand, the Immortal Iron Fist. <laughs> Danny Rand, <laughs> the Immortal Iron Fist of Kunlung. I do apologise, yes. I figured because we weren't in-game, we didn't have to say his real no, no. name. But it, it, it's always on. It never stops. <laughs> um, so his, obviously, big spender. I think it's eight eight power it costs, isn't it? Uh, or nine power, yeah, I think it is. Fist. Eight or nine. Um, and it just puts an activation token on your opponent. Um, yeah. So you're coming up against... Uh, a Thanos with a couple of gems or Big Daddy D uh, or, you know, any five plus threat character that is really going to cause you some problems, you know, walk up and using a three threat, you know, put an activator token on them. Yeah. And I believe it's, it's not even, uh, there's no, there's not even a trigger on that. Is there? It just, it just happens whether you it, do. It just happens. Yeah. And also he's got a nice little range three explosion from that as well. Yes. Uh, yeah. He just walks up and slaps them and goes, no activation for you this round. <laughs> no, he is uh, he is good. Um, one of the things we mentioned, obviously, with um, with uh, Murdoch, because really Murdoch is the big damage dealer in that in yeah, that core he, he of your list, isn't it? All star player. Yeah, um, is obviously a lack of uh, movement. Right, he's on a uh, he's on a bigger base. Uh, I think he's on a medium base, isn't he? No, um, no, he's on the 65 mil. Oh, he's on the 65 mil, yes. Yeah. So he's on the large base, but that short move really does hamper him. Um, yes, Red Skull has that that place, which is is really, really nice. I also don't mind taking other characters um, who can help Modoc out in that department as well. Um, so I quite like the dog. I, yep. I don't, I, you know, I, I, I think he works quite well. I mean, um, he is this boy he is um, the bestest boy yes yeah and then um, also in terms of other modoc support uh i think you have to give a mention to the, the best two threat in the game you go okoye oh, absolutely and and i won't go through all the reasons why but if you can let a two threat character take the punch rather than your five threat character um just do it um you know that's that that's a, a, an absolute no-brainer so quinn Cabal are one of the affiliations that we only get two tactics cards um, that are exclusively for them, don't we? Um, so we've got Cosmic Invigoration, and then we've got Dark Rain. Um, so Dark Rain basically allows you to reroll your attack dice. I think it's any number of attack dice. And then Cosmic Invigoration removes the activator token from a character, but there is a chance that you're going to do some damage to yourself on that one, isn't there, as well? Yeah, they're both, like, decent cards. I think 
Specifically in Skull Cabal, uh, Cosmic Invigoration takes the edge, uh, simply because while Stark Rain is great at just picking an enemy character and going, you died today, um, you just, in that core, you have a bunch of rerolls already in the form yeah. of, you know, uh, Strategic Genius, Master Swordsman, and um, whatever Modox 1 is called. Is it P-Brain? P-Brain, Modox yeah. Genius is Infinite, That's something like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, like, you just have so many rerolls that you can already, like, get natively that... I think usually you have better uses for that card slot than just sort of, you know, confounding on that even more and just going, ah, more rerolls. I, I like rolling dice, let's do it some more. Whereas you could, you know, take some sort of other unaffiliated card or character-specific card that might benefit you better. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. I, I tend to not take Dark Rain. Three power to reroll dice isn't a great use of power, especially when, as you mentioned, Murdoch can already spend three power and re-roll three dice, um, or he can spend five power and re-roll five dice. So, yeah, for me, for me, it's not a needed one. Um, Cosmic Invigoration, however, absolute must-take. Pretty much goes into not only every roster I create for Cabal, um, but usually makes it into my five tactics cards that I'm taking, and that's really to use it on Murdoch, right? You know, the fact that you can get double activation from Murdoch is is pretty powerful. Um, yeah, extremely so. I mean, you know, you're a big fan of Difficult to Please, aren't you, Rich? <laughs> I am indeed. I am indeed. Uh, anything that gets me more activations uh, per round uh, is, uh, yeah, is good in my book. Character-specific cards then. So from the our core three, we only actually have um, two tactics cards that we can take i believe don't we which are aim lackeys and psychic fortress both from murdoch so let's talk about psychic fortress first because i think there's a place for this but it costs quite a lot yeah isn't it four power uh three power uh three power you get a, four, a range it? four yeah yeah so i quite like it you i mean again you know me from my brotherhood list i you know the, the the is it magnetic refraction i think it's called yeah is an unbelievable card all right that only costs two power but it is only range three but it comes back into your hand yeah that that's sort of the key factor that makes that card viable whereas this card is sort of less often seen uh just because you know for a round getting cover that's really nice but when you there's another affiliation that does that just so much better in the yeah. form of refraction like you, you do sort of feel it's a little bit subpar by comparison. Not that Modok needs more help. Um, he is still one of the better models in the game, um, especially at the five threat slot. But yeah, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. One, one of those unfortunate things where that card just isn't quite there anymore. No, I agree. I agree. In Lackey's, on the other hand, um, for me, if I'm taking Modok, whether it's in this Cabal list or indeed any list. Um, Aim Lack is, is a, an almost auto-include for me, at least in the roster. It may not make it into every squad, um, but giving another character another move for free, not for free, for, for three power, especially in this roster where, you know, Murdoch is not going to struggle to generate power because he's going to generate his own power from doing his own attacks, plus the leadership, plus your opponent's going to try and kill him. So you're going to end up with quite a lot of power on Murdoch. Um, and I think it's a great way to be able to spend it uh, and get one of your allies up the board quicker than they would do otherwise. Uh, that are your thoughts? Yeah, I think it's a really nice card to have. Um, I'm not sure about its specific inclusion in this Red Skull Cabal roster. Um, there are some horrible things you can do with it in terms of... Uh, Wakandan Herb, which actually, <laughs> you know, if you have the right power setup, you can use with Zemo. Um, you have to find a way to get some extra power on him, but he can sort of, he can go a fair distance with it by, you know, getting the aim lackey's move and then doing uh, a couple of steel rushes to get more medium moves and then end up on that. Uh, I think it's the altar in Herb. I think, I think it is the. I think altar. it is the altar, isn't it? Yeah. I think it is the altar. Yeah, I I I do like it. Like you say, I think um, especially unlike some you know like Azima, um, where it's 
you know, it's it's a long move, so it feels like you're getting more out of it. You know, it costs the same whether that character is a you know short, medium, or or long base. Um, oh, sorry, short, medium, or long move. Um, so I think yeah, on a character that moves long as well, being able to go up and get the herb, uh, maybe it's not an auto include in every squad, uh, but I think it's definitely an auto include in in the roster for me. Any other? We we spoke about a couple of characters there that we would include. Uh, in our rosters uh, Mr Sinister obviously comes with a couple of tactics cards um, as well any of those two that you would you would um, take alongside I mean I, I think if you're taking one of them you're probably taking the other one uh, so you've got forced extraction which is pay one power uh, up to three allies within three take damage you get a sample token for each uh, and then you've got the cloning banks which is probably Sinister's biggest draw even though he's not really a slouch uh in terms of his own character card, being able to bring in another character in the middle of the game, fully healthy and decked out with three power, can be really good. It's 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 very very good, isn't it? Um, you know, it's one of the reasons why you want to make sure if you're taking Sinister, for me at least anyway, you've got a couple of options in the two threat department to be able to bring in. Unfortunately, the the one two threat option that the Cabal have. I think he's probably one of the worst characters to use it on. I mean, being, being considering Bob, Bob um, shows up and doesn't have his rocket he, loaded, yeah, yeah he, he, he's not particularly happy with that result. But, you know, for me, um, Okoye and Nebula, um, for, for opposite reasons almost, uh, work really well with this. Obviously, Okoye for the defensive side of it. Um, so, you know, turn two, you can essentially bring Okoye, Okoye in. Um, so you've gone from having a, you know, let's say a 17 uh, threat roster to a, sorry, a 17 threat squad to a, a 19 threat squad um, is is super powerful. Um, and then Nebula for the alternative. So, you know, Nebula for, you know, bringing her in and giving you some extra damage uh, towards you know, the latter part of the game can, can always be really nice. And the fact that he can spend those tokens making him considerably more tankier than what he looks like at first glance. Yeah, he can also give out root with them, I believe. He can, yes, he can, which if you are taking Loki, I mentioned I liked Loki, um, those conditions do stack. So Loki's bubble, uh, or Loki's aura, sorry, and, uh, and the root condition do stack, which means that your opponent has to pay two power before they can use a superpower. So if a superpower costs them three to spend, it's going to end up costing them five to spend uh, beforehand, which you know it becomes very, very crippling uh, as well. On to restricted cards. Quinn, I always tell people when they're looking at building a roster, uh, once they've looked at character-specific and affiliation-specific tactics cards, the next place they should be looking at is the restricted list. Um, the reason being they are restricted for a reason. They are considered to be the best tactics cards in the game. So, Quinn, right now we've got six restricted tactics cards, but we know that there is going to be an update to that restricted and banned list coming out. Um, so what we've done is we've taken a, a punt at what is going to be in the future in the hope that we get it right so these videos become relevant for longer. Um, so we've got Patch Up, Brace for Impact, Med Pack, Doom Prophecy, Field Dressing. All you've got, we believe, is going to go on the banned list. And then the last one that we think is going to be on the restricted list, Quinn, is... Bitter Rivals. You know <laughs> it, you love it, you probably actually hate it. Yeah, I think it definitely goes up there, doesn't it? You know, three three power to affect so many characters in yeah. the game. Um, on both attack and defence is very, very powerful. Um, so for the purposes of these, we are keeping it at six restricted cards. So we're taking out all you've got, putting it in the band list and putting in bit arrivals in its place. Quinn, one that sticks out straight away to me for this roster, for this squad or this core squad of three characters, Brace for Impact. Um, oh, size... that's not the one I thought you were going to go with. Okay. I, me... I, I thought that you were going to go with field dressing, but yeah, I do think Brace is a very good card to have with your two physical defense Modoc hanging about. Yeah, very, very susceptible to throws. 
very susceptible to being thrown as well because he is yeah. a size four. So he can he can really hurt some of the characters around him. Um, you know, if Thor wants damage. to go bowling with Modok's head, uh, <laughs> Zemo's not going to have a good time. He's he's most definitely not. And you know the the big thing that this team has are a lot of rerolls. Um, none of those rerolls apply to dodge rolls, so it's only attack or defense rolls. So very susceptible to throws. And I think you know for for one or two power, which is what you're going to pay for this card, negating all of that damage. It, it, for me, is just a, a no-brainer to put that in there. Yeah, I, I would wholeheartedly agree with that. What are what are a couple of others then, Quinn? That you that you would look at? Um, I mean, I did mention another card uh, in the form of field dressing that I think is really, really good uh, if you're taking you know big, big-headed gun turret that is Modok. Um, because you know, what, once your opponent has you know gone to all the effort of finally taking him down getting through that 10 health with the wild negation. It'd be really funny if you just walked up to him and went, four power, he's back. Ha. <laughs> Effectively spitting yeah. your opponent's face, which I think is always a good thing to do, really. Yeah, and I think you've got so many options in this game to do that. We already mentioned power generation is one of the key things with this affiliation, but let's go back to Red Skull in a, mo a moment. Um, Cosmic Cube. Yep. Take an action, gain three power. You gain one power every turn anyway, so you're pretty much guaranteed to have enough power to be able to play field dressing on Murdoch at, at any point during the game itself, really, aren't you? Yeah, and it's just so impactful, especially if you, your opponent hasn't activated during that round. Bringing him back and just going, okay, uh, you worked really hard on this, now I'm getting to activate my five threat anyway, and potentially I'm retaining priority to do it again before you actually get to kill him. Yeah. Uh, it just seems really strong. Yeah, and I think that's the key thing, isn't it? That it's almost like him coming back on his flip side with all that power, but it's just an almost an extra an extra life for him, really, isn't it? Which on Murdoch is 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 so so powerful. I just mentioned bit of rivals. What what are your thoughts on that card, both in this list, um, with it with it being restricted now? Do you still think it makes the cut, or...? So, Rivals is an interesting one. I think uh, Rivals will depend a great deal on, sort of, your local meta and what you expect to face. Um, if you're seeing a lot of people that have, you know, superpower throws that can throw people size 4, uh, you're probably better off taking Brace. But if that's less prevalent uh, with in your area, um, I, I think Rivals does have a place because you simply just have so much power to be able to spend it on rivals pretty much any turn you want and you know you're already really good at killing people but you're even better at killing people if they've got minus one defense no absolutely absolutely um another card i want to just throw into the mix because we, we we mentioned about taking the bestest boy um <clears throat> what are your thoughts on last minute save is it is it worth a tactics card slot and then a slot, you know, in your in your squad um, to stop Murdoch from being KO'd in the first place. So last minute save is just one of those cards that I'm not really a big fan of, uh, simply because uh, a lot of the time when a character is being KO'd, you know, you know, you can spend your three power and you can save them, bring them back with one elf, and then you know within one of Lockjaw. But depending on how your board state is set up and things like that, that might not actually be far enough away to save them. And also, you know, if you stop a character from being cared, that's great. But if, you know, th there are so many options your opponent has to limit that ability. For example, you know, Lockjaw has to be within three of the character being KO'd, which, you know, a savvy opponent will probably have some tools in their kit to just go, well, I'm just going to move that character over there so they're not within three with like you know an advance or a throw or a push of some kind and yeah. just sort of ignoring the dog um also a lot of the time the dog might not actually have three power at the start of a turn before he's activated because a lot of the time you're either shifting people about to you know set yourself up for the next turn or something during you know that round uh and then also you've got the interdimensional bloodhound to consider i think a lot of the time you'll spend power on that to sort of mark a character out so i think unless you're 
very specifically planning around it in terms of the amount of power the dog has, and also you're uh, fairly confident your opponent can't do anything to interrupt it. I think it's just sort of a, it, it. It's a decent card, but I don't think it really has the place uh, just in that roster generally. No, fair enough. We touched on um, a character who has dedicated tactics cards. Uh, who we said is is good for this roster uh, in Mr. Sinister. Uh, we also mentioned Killmonger. I am a fan. I think if you're taking Killmonger, the assumption then is that you sit at the throne is a, is an auto include, right? There's no oh, real yeah. reason to to not take that card. What one hundred percent? If you're taking Killmonger, that card is stapled onto him, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. No. Absolutely. So a couple of other. Um, unaffiliated cards then that we see get a reasonable amount of play um first one up and i think it works really well in this list um advanced r d yep uh get like you know shifting power around is always good uh enabling zemo to get a turn one charge seems yep. pretty good especially with that power generation from red school as well right so you can yeah you know if you really wanted to, you could take Zemo and Killmonger, uh, do Cosmic Cube with Skull to get the power, shift the power out to those two, and then suddenly, you know, you've got... Set, say you've set them up on a flank each, you've got two very real threats for your opponent to yeah. consider if they want to go anywhere near, say, a midline extract. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and then the other one is um, a card that I, I've seen played uh, sort of more and more of late. Um Blind Obsession. Yeah, it's it's one of those cards that ha has a really good upside, but also is balanced by the fact that it has a really bad downside. I think you see this card, you, you will see this card a great deal more if Bitter Rivals does get restricted, just because it's sort of a lesser version, it's a more focused version of yeah. Bitter Rivals, effectively. Yeah, I agree. I think um, I, I, it, it's hard, isn't it? Because you have to play it at the start of your activation phase. So yeah. typically means that you are going to want to have priority to play this card, right? Because if you don't... Yeah. Um, it's very, very difficult. Um, I, I, if I you don't, don't... Really play this card when you don't have priority, yeah. because yeah, think, things will just die horrible, <laughs> horrible deaths uh, with that minus two defense dice. They will let it's a very spread out sort of map setup, and you've only you're sort of dueling with another character on a flank, and those are the only two people. You, you've got your own character and then the enemy character, and those are the only two characters that can really interact with that side of the board. I think then it's yeah, potentially you get the extra defense dice. Yeah, potentially. Yeah, absolutely. If you if you're isolated, uh, you know, if you're on a um, what like a C objective or something, and you know, like you say, you have got two characters battling out on the on the far right hand side of the board or something, and everybody else is either in the middle or over to the left hand side. I think that can work. Queen, any other um, unaffiliated cards, sort of generic cards that can be used by anyone? that you would put up for consideration in, in um, your roster? So the only other one that I would really consider is uh, Disarm, if you're playing sort of a taller playstyle. And by that I mean uh, having sort of a more concentrated uh, number of characters. Rather than spreading out wide, you build up tall and you have, you know, multiple sort of big heavy hitter characters. Uh, because in lists like that, you're quite likely to retain priority each round, which yeah. means that, you know... A, you get to, you know, have your pick of who you want to murder first, which is always fun. Uh, but also, if your opponent has a big threat that could really uh, mess up your day, uh, being able to pay a power off of two people uh, for, I think it's range three? Uh, range three, three, yes, yeah, it is. Yeah, range three, uh, just being, being able to go, okay, Modok and Sinister or whoever pay a power each that character now gets minus two attack dice for the rest of the round is really strong. Um, especially against, say, a Venom or a Daredevil, you know, any of those characters that can sort of attack at a point that isn't on their turn, or, you know, on a rapid-fire character like Domino. Uh, she gets quite sad when she's throwing two dice at people. <laughs> she really does. She really does. So, Quinn, lastly then... Um, crisis cards. Uh, so obviously there's extracts and there's secures. Um, we're going to talk more around the the map layouts, aren't we? Rather than specific 
uh, crisis cards. We may run in, we may go into one or two that uh, you want to avoid, but we're going to talk more about the the shape of the map and um, the, the 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 layouts that suit this setup. Um, so I'm going to sort of throw my first one into the hat, which is the anything on the on the e side of things. So I think is the you know gamma shelter and those sorts of ones um, for me work quite well with this setup. Yeah, I think they work exceptionally well. Um, as we've mentioned previously, Red Skull Cabal is most definitely a kill-focused list. Um, it, it really thrives through attrition. Uh, and if you have a secure setup like an E, or potentially a C, um, people tend to get clustered together, which makes it, you know, sort of... It turns Modoc into a kid in a candy shop, basically. <laughs> Absolutely. Being able to get off uh, two, two potentially four Doomsday chairs in uh, in a single activation is is probably going to devastate your enemy quite a bit, isn't it? Um, yeah. We have we have spoke about um, Wakanda and Herb, uh, and I and I and I mentioned Wakanda and Herb because it's you know we could say a. But but it's it's Wakanda and Herb, right? That's the I believe the only one that uses yeah, that's, that's that only... uses that at the moment. So I think it can work, but I think you need to have a very specific plan in mind. Um, and I don't think that plan necessarily involves Zemo. It, it's sort of fa fairly common knowledge that uh, Ghost Spider and Modok together with a name like he's on Wakanda and Herb is incredibly potent because. You know, you give Gwen a free move after she's picked up the herb on turn one. So this is sort of the start of turn two play. You give her the free move with eight lackeys. She does a long move. She gets within two of an enemy. She punches them in the face. She's already moved that round, which then activates part of her spider technique, which lets her move long again. You then move to within two of someone else that's closer to the altar. You punch them. And then, you know, you, you do another long move, you, you zip back to the altar, and you, you're effectively scoring four VPs on turn two, which is a very large swing if your opponent doesn't expect it or have anything sort of prepared to deal with it. Um, and also, you know, those two punches you're doing with Gwen are actually at five dice each because the herb gives you an extra die, which is yeah. really nice. And once again, the extra power from the Cabal leadership. The master of yep. evil as well so again power generation not not a problem uh in that which are the ones either specific crisis or just certain map setups that we want to avoid when when we're looking at uh, the cabal roster so i think sort of the general wisdom is that modok isn't the biggest fan of d deployment uh because you know sort of your wide ones are on the midline uh your down the center of the board ones are really quite far back from each other. Um, Modok doesn't really get to have his son kill any kill everyone he wants. Uh, that is somewhat mitigated by the inclusion of the dog. The dog doing a range three teleport on that 65 mil base is really powerful uh, in terms of just getting Modok where he needs to be. But I still think a lot of the time you'd rather just play an E and not have to bother with the dog a lot of the time. Yeah, I think um, I do agree to some extent. I think Hammers, because Hammers is on a D, isn't it? And you can then, with a Murdoch, I believe, pick up a Hammer without moving. I want yeah, to say that, that's that true. is sort of the big consideration. I was talking more in the vein of uh, D secures, but yeah, okay. Hammers is good for everyone, especially <laughs> if you've got a 65 mil base. Ham yeah, everyone, everyone loves Hammers, but I agree. Um, you know, Portals of a Run and the other um there's another one isn't there uh riot is it riot that's on d as well i want to yeah, say riot i think so extreme is a d uh spider portals is a d modok absolutely hates that one yeah uh teleporting that big base range two makes him very sad yeah, uh, and absolutely, I believe yeah. got cosmic vault which also isn't something modok is a big fan of because it could lead to him being pushed out of position yeah absolutely yeah. absolutely any any yeah anything that um Anything that's going to allow your opponent to move your Murdoch is bad. Yeah, so hopefully that gives everyone an idea of uh, the sorts of, of crisis cards that we want to be uh, want to be looking at. One thing that we didn't mention at the beginning that I think is is worth doing here as well now, Quinn, is um, 
where are we good? Where are we bad? What matchups do does this roster like of this core of Red Skull, Murdoch, and Zemo? Um, and then are there some matchups where you look at it and go, actually, it's worth taking another three pointer plus a two pointer rather than a, a five threat Murdoch, for example? I mentioned pushes earlier, and, and that's one thing that Murdoch really does struggle with, doesn't he? Being being manipulated and being pushed around by your opponent. Yeah, there are certain things you can do to mitigate it, like backstopping uh, with another character. So backstopping is effectively, um, depending on the direction of the push, say it's Shuri's Panther Gauntlets, she pushes away. Um, if you put a character, say a Red Skull, directly behind Modok in sort of the line that Shuri would be pushing on, he can't then be moved. But, you know, there are various other ways of, you know, Modok being messed around, say, with bows like um, Enchantress's uh, Siren's Call, I believe it's called. Uh, I think so it is, advancing yeah. a Modok short way. Or, you know, if you're in a mirror match where another Modok is just going, well, you can go over there out of range of me after I've attacked you a couple of times or after I've attacked someone else. Uh, it can be quite debilitated for, you know, the, the big-headed boy. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Cool. So what we thought we'd finish off with, guys, is just a quick example roster of Cabal. Me and Quinn have just really quickly put this together, um, kind of taking into account everything we discussed as part of the, the video and really a plan for everything that we've got. So let's start off then. We'll take you through the characters we've chosen. So we've got Red Skull, Okoye, Nebula, Mr. Sinister, Murdoch, Baron Zemo, Enchantress, Ghost Spider, Killmonger and Lockjaw. We've then got Demons, Gamma Wave, Infinity Formula, Mystic Wakandan Herbs, Research Station Attacked, and Struggle for the Cube. And then we've got Aim Lackeys, Advanced R&D, Brace for Impact, Cloning Banks, Cosmic Invigoration, Field Dressing, Forced Extraction, and Usurp the Throne. And wow, it's actually worked first time there, Quinn, uh, and, uh, <laughs> and, and did everything for us. Um, should we run through a couple of examples then for each of these uh, sort of setups? Because we've got some some varying uh, threat levels here, haven't we? Yeah, so, planning for the different threat levels, I think, is probably a good idea. Yeah, so um, let's take one that we mentioned earlier, um, uh, Wakandan Herbs, 15 yeah, threats. I, I think this is one of the easiest ones to fill out. So you've got your core of, you know, uh, Skull, Zemo and Modok. Um, and I think just on top of that, you add Gwen and you're at a solid 15. Absolutely. Yeah. Quinn mentioned earlier, there's a really nice play that you can do uh, with the herb, with Ghost Spider. You do need to take a couple of cards for that as well. So Yeah, so you'll be taking Aim Lackeys. Um, that's the only card that you specifically need for it, but you might want some sort of protective cards in the form of like Brace, if someone's going to walk up and throw a size four at Gwen when she's on the altar. Yeah, I mean, I think but in this... It actually sounds like a really bad wedding day. Um... <laughs> it really does. I actually think in this setup we are uh, we are forced actually of to which cards we have to take. Uh, so it would be Ames, Advanced R and D, yeah. uh, Brace, Cosmic, and Field Dressing because the other three uh, have three and I think cards. That that will probably be sort of the set of tactic cards that you take a lot of the time, unless you're slotting in one of those two other characters yes. that the other cards correspond to. No, absolutely. And I don't think that's bad by any stretch. No, not at all. They are all very, very solid cards. Um, so let's have a look then. Let's pick another one. So Infinity Formulas. This is on a on a B map. Uh, this is the one where everyone gains even more power. Um, so and it's not just one person, is it? It's anyone contesting the uh, the uh, Serum Canister as well. So taking Ghost Spider out then and sticking with our core of Murdoch, Red Skull, and Baron Zemo. Um, who else? How, how do we make up the other five threat then on this one, do you think? Uh, so the five threat on this, I think you could... I, I think you're kind of locked into something here, actually, and I think it has to be a three and a two. It's... Unless you want to change Zemo into a four threat and then you get another four threat in. Yeah, potentially. So you, you could change Zemo out for like a Killmonger and then take a Sinister or, you know, uh, an Amora. Yeah, I don't, I don't hate this. I don't hate Killmonger and Sinister, um, with a view then that you can bring in either a Nebula or an Okoye um, at the end of turn two, 
I think that's quite, uh, or is it end of turn two, beginning of turn three, whichever way around it works, but I think that's quite nice. Um, yeah, I also, I also don't mind this either. Um, so bringing in uh, Amora instead of Sinister, because um, she brings both the energy and the mystic attack and i really think it's going to be dependent on who you're coming up against um yeah and i if... think a lot a lot of the time on that b uh having the ability to bow on both flanks is actually really powerful yes yeah that's, let's, let's not forget that so yeah being able yeah. to uh being able to move uh, your opponent there um i think this is going to be very much depending on who you're coming up against um yeah i would say if you're coming up against a convocation team you know, Sinister is not the one you want to be taking. Um, that, that, you know, that Beam 3 energy is going to be far more effective against them uh, than uh, the Beam 1 attack, sorry, the Beam 4 genetic splicing. Um, and once again, Killmonger in there with the Black Ops Strike. Energy and, and, and physical are really going to ruin your Convocations day, aren't they? Yeah, definitely. Cool. Guys, hopefully you found that useful. As I mentioned, this is the first in a series of videos that we're putting together. Quinn, thank you so much for joining me on this one. Hopefully you found it fun as well. No worries, it was my pleasure. Excellent. Guys, leave us comments down in the comments section below. Uh, do you like the lists we've put together? Do you like the final roster? Um, any other hints and tips you can give to any other players out there? Slap them all down in the comment section below. Um, remember, we've got our competition running for the month of September, where one lucky viewer will be winning a brand new character pack yet to be confirmed. So make sure that you have subscribed and make sure that you leave a comment down in this or any other video from the month of September to be with a chance of winning. As always, it leaves me just enough time to say stay well, keep safe, and until next time, bye for now. See you.